Welcome to the TI STEM Exchange. My name is Peter McLaren. I am your host tonight. You know, the TI STEM Exchange is an opportunity for STEM educators to explore, discuss, and learn about STEM education efforts across the country. Each month, we will bring you a panel of professionals dedicated to high quality STEM education and working on innovative and interesting projects. What we hope you will appreciate most of all about this series is the opportunity it presents to you to dialogue, to be able to have conversations with colleagues and learn along with the team about things that are happening in the STEM field. We do this by engaging you all in breakout groups and don't be afraid of them. It's a great opportunity to be able to discuss what the learning is about for this STEM exchange series. And when we're talking about the having the opportunity to work professionals, have we got some professionals for you tonight? We're pleased to bring along some great names in the world of mathematics. Mary Pittman will be tonight's session uh, moderator and the topic presentation will be presented by Ted Coe and Tammy, Tammy Bauman. We know you're gonna love it. And we're recording tonight's session. So you're gonna be receiving a link later on so that you can use this if you wanna be able to catch up on notes or go back and see some things that you were particularly interested in. You're gonna receive that link in a few days or so. And what we, we do suspect that all of you have had experience with Zoom, but we'd like to remind you to please mute yourself when you're not speaking. That just really helps the whole presentation. You're welcome to turn your Visio on. And with such a large number of session attendees, we think you have the best experience. You set your video to speaker view using the drop down portion of the upper right hand side of your Zoom screen. We'll spotlight each speaker as they present. And this setting will allow you to always have your video tuned to the person presenting. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary Pittman. Now, Dr. Pittman has over 20 years of experience working in the field of K-12 mathematics education. Presently, the director of mathematics at the new, teacher pro te the new Teacher Project, excuse me. She began her career as a middle school mathematics teacher in St. Cloud, Minnesota, before moving to Colorado to work on her PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder. After completing her doctoral studies, Mary became the director of mathematics at Boulder Valley School District before moving to the Colorado Department of Education, developing culturally and linguistically responsive mathematics. Mary is passionate about mathematics and you certainly will see that tonight. And we're fortunate to have her as the moderator. Take it away, Mary. Thanks, Peter. Um, I am really looking forward to tonight's conversation. Uh, before I begin, um, I'd like to say thank you to all of you um, for joining this call. I it's I don't know about the rest of you, but it's a long day, and this has been a long week already. Um, so I know how tirelessly you're all working to help your students achieve, and just the million things you're doing to go above and beyond in the last year and over the last couple of years. Um, and and I know that you're working really hard to to improve students' um, STEM skills and knowledge each day. And I. The reason I'm excited about this session is I think there's going to be a lot of new ways for you to think about how to gain insight into your students thinking as a result of tonight. So a quick look for um, our agenda for the evening. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to learn about our formative conversation starters. Um, they're just a kernel of an idea in our presenters minds when I first started talking to them about them, which I don't even know if I can remember how long ago that was. But as they've developed this concept and shared their progress, my excitement has only grown and its potential for supporting students and educators is just, um, it, it really has me excited. Um, in my role at TNTP, um, which is an education nonprofit, you might've heard of us because of national reports like the Opportunity Myth. I spend a lot of time working with educators and really supporting them to think about ways that they can ensure students have opportunities to really learn grade level mathematics and over the past decade, I've really seen rapid improvements and curricular kinds of innovations. But I have to say that the assessment community has not been keeping up, in my opinion. Um, and so that's why I'm excited about tonight, because I think that these formative conversation starters are really a unique and new way of exploring what we know about what students are understanding in mathematics. 
So I'm going to introduce our three presenters in just a minute. And uh, they've created an exciting interactive session for us. Um, I and the Texas Instruments team will support by watching the chat. So please make sure to add any questions or thoughts that you have as they're presenting that come to mind. Um, and then as time allows, at the end of the session, we'll, we'll have a chance to share those questions and ask the presenters and share some of those observations. And then there'll be just a few closing remarks by myself and Texas Instruments and a wrap up by 8.30 tonight, Eastern time. So with that, let's introduce tonight's presenters. Um, our first presenter is Ted Coe. Um, I've known Ted for, oh gosh, I'm going to just say a decade because I'm afraid that if I actually say it, it'll be, make me um, remember how old I've, I'm getting. Um, and I've followed his work ever since. Frankly, his career has allowed him both a unique understanding of K-12 mathematics and higher education. And for these reasons, he's one of my favorite thought partners. We often have Friday coffee um, virtually and really niggle through some really naughty issues around system and classroom level work in STEM education. Um, and he continues to push the field um, in really critical ways. I also recently found out that Ted has a extensive calculator collection. Um, so if you ever meet Ted, you'll have to ask him about some of his calculators because I had no idea until last week and I've known him for over a decade. Um, so I'll let Ted go ahead and say hello. Hello and thank you for the kind words and also Mary for taking the time out to moderate for us this evening. And then I want to introduce Tammy. Uh, even though I have not known Tammy quite as long as Ted, um, she's already on my speed dial. Uh, Tammy brings to the team a wealth of K-12 uh, experience, both teaching, but also coaching, administration. Um, I see her as one of the key people who have worked to ensure, I said how I think we've made strides in curriculum work. Um, I see Kit Tammy as one of the people who's really been on the lead and that work and I am so excited that she's joined the NWEA team um, because bringing her talents to the field of assessment can only help us and really um, I hope innovate and bring us uh, further along in that space. We'll let Tammy say hello. Good evening everyone. I'm so excited to do some math this fine evening and um, share some of our work with you. Thanks Mary. Thank you. And then our final presenter to Today is Anita. She's a brand new addition to the NWEA team. Um, she is a native Chicagoan uh, where she worked at Perspectives Charter Schools. Uh, she is passionate about providing space to allow the brilliance of children to shine through. And I, I will, you will get to see that already this evening. Um, and, and just really something that's missing too often in our conversations around, around assessment. Um, her lens is really a truly asset-based and social justice lens that comes through in all of her work with educators. And uh, she'll have a chance towards the end of the session to really share some of what she's been doing um, before she left the classroom and before she left, uh, and before she started NWBA, how she was using these formative conversation starters in her own work. Uh, so I'll, I'll give Anita a chance to say hello. Good evening from Chicago. Thank you very much, Mary. I'm very happy to be here with you all. All righty. Well, uh, and now I am just excited to hand off the controls to our presenters and settle in and learn right along with the rest of you tonight. All right, thank you so much. Hey, uh, I, hope, I hope you're excited to get into doing some math with us this evening because uh, when, you, when you talk about the formative conversation starters and this kind of work, you can't separate, uh, you can't just talk around the math. You actually have to talk about the mathematics. And so we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do some of that. Uh, first, I wanna, I wanna say that when, when it comes to teaching and learning mathematics, uh, what, what, does it, what, what does it mean? What does it require? What are some of the minimums that you would have to bring to the table in order to say, yes, there is mathematics teaching and learning happening here? I asked myself that uh, along the, my 20 years of teaching mathematics, and, and I kind of gelled it down to three, three things to remember. Uh, it's not exhaustive, but there are three very important things that uh, we keep, I keep at the front of my mind as I'm doing all of this kind of work. One is that mathematics learning at a minimum means learning ways of thinking. Come back to that. It also means learning habits of thinking, such as the mathematical practices or beliefs. It also involves ways of doing. We know that we want to have ways of doing. We want the ways of thinking, the habits of thinking, and the ways of doing. 
or more specifically, ways of thinking that are empowered by the habits of thinking, along with an ability to make sense of and use some ways of doing, to what end? To do something bigger with the mathematics. Ways of thinking, habits of thinking, ways of doing. Now, most of us would have a good idea of what we mean by ways of doing, and, and with the practices and other beliefs, we've got some notion of, of, of habits of thinking, but I want to stress tonight uh, what we mean when we speak of ways of thinking. So I want to start with an example, and it's a, it's a question, and it just says this, how many years was it from December 7th, 1941 to December 7th, 2014? You thinking about it? Do you have an answer? Yeah, there's an answer. I hope you have an answer. Uh, the, my next question is, well, how did you figure it out? How did you figure it out? Did you, did you, did you bring in a way of doing? Did you, did you set up and, and put the algorithm down and do the 15 easy steps and borrow and do all that sort of thing? Because typically when I ask this with groups of, you know, large groups of people, that doesn't happen. Instead, you get ways of thinking that surface. Like some might say, you know, there were, there were 59 years from 1941 to 2000. There are another 14 years on top of that. So uh, there were 73 years. So what did that involve? It involved thinking about, I'm trying to find this gap between two numbers. Uh, and, and, and maybe it's a, the subtraction could do it for me, but subtraction can also be thought of as sort of this undoing addition. And I can think of putting pieces together to fill in the gaps. I, I can bring all kinds of ways of thinking to solve the problem. And that way of doing that we were taught that showed up at the end of the progression isn't necessarily the one that we all bring to the table. Another possibility is that you shift the whole thing. You realize that in that sort of additive comparison space, if I were to slide the whole thing down by one year, I get numbers that are easier to work with. And so it might be easier to work from 1940 to 2013. That makes it a little, you, you, you have ways of thinking that allow you to understand and own the problem that you're talking about. This is an interesting quote because it comes from a reporter from the Boston Globe. And uh, she was, she, this, as I recall this, the story was that she was a little bit, she was a, a little bit questioning sort of some of these new math ideas, right? And, and, uh, and she went to a workshop and in the workshop, she learned that subtraction is just, this is an adult, uh, subtraction is just an addition, the distance between two numbers. In my head, negative numbers turn from a series of tricks to memorize into concepts I could visualize. And so while we're sitting here going, yes, the ways of thinking, understand that that's not the way that a lot of the people around us might think of the mathematics. In other words, mathematics has been just gelled down to the way of doing. There are all kinds of reasons for that. But what we want to say is we can't, we can't extract the ways of thinking and the habits of thinking from the ways of doing. We need to keep all of these things on the table at the same time. That's our goal. We want all of these things to be working together. Here's another example of ways of thinking. I could ask this question. What does it really mean to say something is out of proportion? What does it really mean to say something is out of proportion? Now, the first time I asked myself that question, I realized I did not have a good answer to it. And so I thought, well, I, I, should, I should have a good answer to that, right? I should be able to say something that, what does it mean to say something is out of proportion? Right? Or what does it mean to say in proportion? Right, it, that, because, a, because there's all kinds of words when we say the word proportion that come to mind. Just stop for a second, think of all the brain clutter that shows up when you say that when, when I talk about proportion or proportional relationships or proportional reasoning. All the things that come into your mind that clutter it up and, it, and then gel down to the way of doing, of cross multiplying or setting up a, a proportion and solving, which by the way is not in the standards, the common core standards, it was never there, but proportional reasoning was. There's something different. Then you ask yourself this kind of question. Well, I think I have an answer to that something out of proportion, but then, I, then you gotta ask yourself, honestly, does it also apply to the equation y equals rx? Does it also apply to the equation a over b equals c over d? Does it also apply to and extend to the saying that a is inversely proportional to b? Or how about this one? And I'm not, you, okay, I will be honest. This comes from a real life example. Your significant other saying, you really blew that issue out of proportion. It's happened to me, all right? Maybe it's happened to you too. But uh, when my wife said that to me, once I had to stop and go, what, 
huh, I blew it out of, what, 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 that's a math word. I should, I should have some way to talk about exactly what that means mathematically. Well, so interesting, uh, Dick Stanley uh, from Berkeley, had, he got a room of mathematicians, math educators, and teachers together and, and asked this question, a very similar question to what I just asked you. What does it mean in general to say that one quantity is proportional to another quantity? A room full of mathematicians, math educators, and teachers. What do you think happened when he asked that question? I bet, I bet you can guess. I'm not, I'll just let you see what he wrote. He said it this way, the confusing jumble of responses is disturbing. <laughs> At the very least, it points to lack of common understanding within the school math community in the very basic and important subject. Now, if you're here and you're a professional uh, learning leader or something like that, I, I hope you're seeing that there's a really good question in there, right? That to be able to, 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 be able to go, hmm, if I asked a room full of teachers that very question, what kind of answers would I get back, right? And so I see math and science, you same idea, right? So what do we do? Well, uh, a, a group of us, including uh, James Tanton from uh, the Global Math Project, uh, Kyle Pierce, uh, April Strom, we, we worked on decluttering it. We worked on what are, what's a way of thinking that you could bring to the table and talk about proportional relationships. And maybe you're here and you're a high school teacher. I hope you go, well, this really applies to high school because when I talk about proportional relationships, I'm talking about something that happens throughout the curriculum. So we start off and we say, you got two or more quantities that you can measure. So before you can go anywhere, you gotta say, I got two quantities. So anytime you're talking about proportional relationship, you should be able to isolate two quantities. You should be able to say what the two quantities are. The measures can or do adopt a variety of possible values. The measures seem related to each other. And I saw somebody get close to this in the, in the, in the writing, but what else is true? So you got, the, you got the two quantities, the two quantities vary. They seem to vary with each other, but more importantly, they, the measures scale in tandem. If I double one, I double the other. If I triple one, I triple the other. When that kind of relationship exists, I would say that I have quantities that are in a proportional relationship. We've decluttered it. That's a way of thinking. We've, we've, we've chiseled it down to that. Now, these ways of thinking are connected to meanings, mathematical meanings. And in fact, if you go back to the NCTM teaching practices, and I hope you've taken the time to, to look at these, one of them talks about facilitating meaningful mathematics discourse. But I want to I want to whittle that down a little bit and say it this way. For what we're talking about here, and hopefully in conversations we all have in the future, when I say or we say meaningful mathematics discourse, we recognize that it has to center on mathematical meanings. You can't talk around them, you have to talk about them. What do you mean when you say, right? Because we know that I could have said earlier proportional relationship and we would have all had all kinds of different meanings in our minds. But if we're gonna communicate with each other, we have to have the shared meanings and we have to find ways to get those meanings onto the table. So ways of thinking, habits of thinking, ways of doing is the framing to walk into this kind of work. So a couple of years ago, we all had a shutdown. Maybe you noticed and the schools closed and we had COVID. And somewhere along the line, during that school year, two years ago, the black bar here represents, well, everything fell apart. We don't know what happened after that black line, right? So we don't know, we don't know mathematically speaking, what sort of meanings or whatever the students may have been working on. But we knew we had the following year. And so we were, you know, there were a lot, I don't know if you remember, there was a lot of talk about, oh, they've lost a couple of months of learning, as we heard, right? What do we do? What do we do? And, and uh, so, we, you know, you, we were thinking about it, the different options that were on the table as well. You could just try to, you could just try to go the same pace, tell the same story in the same way and get as far as you can, right? Just like the, the train keeps going. You could try to squish everything up into, into uh, that second year and try to get everything in there, but that's really tricky because the, a lot of the curriculum is already fast enough for many. And that would result in quite a, bit of, quite a bit of mathematical carnage along the way. Or maybe, and maybe you think about, well, how can I get back on that grade level? How can I work on the grade level things, but bring in and fold in the content from earlier? And you start to think, well, what kind of content is that? And you say, well, maybe I'm not so worried about the ways of doing, but I really am worried about those ways of thinking. Because the students who are coming in, having, having 
missed different opportunities coming into the classroom. We don't know what sort of opportunities they've had, what sort of ways of thinking they've had access to and had the chance to build up. So as you're thinking about folding that mathematics back in, you're thinking about folding in the ways of thinking, the habits of thinking, and the ways of doing, not just the ways of doing, which would be the temptation. So it requires thinking about the standards, thinking outside of your grade level. And we notice obviously there's a renewed urgency to focus on math that transcends grade level standards. There's mathematics that happens in third grade that's still super relevant in seventh grade. The ways of thinking that started there don't expire ever. Ways of thinking continue to grow throughout the grades. And so they need to be reinforced. We often talk of unpacking the standards, but in this case, we're saying, well, you're actually kind of repacking them in new ways in this, in this world. And so we want to talk about what, is it, what does it look like to repack the standards? And importantly, how do we develop these clear shared meanings about the mathematics? So this is what we came up with. And it took us a lot longer than we thought it was going to. But uh, the formative conversation starters to serve that role, to fill that space, grounded in enduring ways of thinking that transcend grade levels. If you're a seventh grade teacher, you're still attending to the ways of thinking that were developed all the way back. And you're continuing, to, you're continuing to revisit them. Invite opportunities to listen to how students are thinking. It's not about right or wrong. It's not about what, don't they, what they don't know. It's about what do they bring in with them? What are the ways of thinking that they're bringing in with them that I can, that I can play from? Most of all, that they're accessible, easy to use, safe. You'll see why we say that in a bit. They're very non-threatening. Uh, they're actually kind of fun and, uh, and free. And so we've got a whole collection of them, grades two through eight. And if you're, uh, if you're a high school teacher, you will find grades six, seven, eight to be very relevant. Those questions that are in there will make you think, they'll make your students think, uh, and they're worth talking about because they will expose the kind of thinking that we have. That's what they're designed to do. Uh, Tammy, I'm gonna hand it over to you now. Thank you, sir. And I cannot see all of your smiling faces tonight, but I know that you're smiling because you get to do some math now. And Everyone likes a little math. So we're gonna explore the formative conversation starters and we're going to do so um, by first starting and looking at how we categorize them. And so what you see in front of you are called bins, big ideas to nurture sense-making. And you'll notice these are large buckets for content. As we develop the formative conversation starters for grades two through eight, um, these bins naturally occurred. Noticing also that they will transcend grade levels. These are not specific to any specific grade. They go through multiple grade levels. And you will get to experience that yourself in just a few moments. Um, so a single item may be in more, may definitely be in more than one bin. And we are going to, going to experience this just a bit. These bins evolved from, as I said, the two through eight work, but most likely they will immediately increase as we do more work in grades two through eight and expand to high school and down to kindergarten. The bin that we're going to look at today is operations. <clears throat> and I'd like to, you to take a minute, and I promise you I'll be quiet, take a minute to read the description of this bin. And if I asked you to highlight a sentence or a phrase here, what would that be and why? And I'm gonna ask you to come off mute actually to discuss this with me. So I will be quiet for a full 60 seconds. And 60 seconds sure does feel like a long time of silence, doesn't it? So I'm going to guess you probably have identified your, your highlighted sentence. Is anyone willing to talk about that? I see connect to everyday meanings. Pop yourself off mute and share with us why that was that resonated with you. Anyone interested in showing their face tonight and helping us understand what resonates with you? I'm seeing authentic to their own lives and should connect to a meaning of division. Nice. I'll come off mute. My name is Katrina. How are you? <laughs> Katrina, thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. So um, I underlined, well, in my mind, the sentence that says operation should never be disconnected from meaning. And the reason why I chose that, I feel that when it comes to, I teach high school, I'm a high school math teacher. 
And I feel that by the time they get to me, everything is just like, um, like a thing that they have memorized. So there's mm-hmm. no meaning attached to it. And then it's so many rules according to them that they have to remember. And it's because it's not, it's not connected to anything from before. So I think that if we teach mathematics in a way where um, you're able to understand the connection with other things, then there's no need to memorize because you truly understand it. Gosh, Katrina, that is really profound. I couldn't have paid you to say that better. Beautiful. I, I In my head, I recreate, equate that to instrumental versus relational understanding. If they all would have come to us with um, relational understanding, everything would connect for them. Beautiful. Anyone else like to share their thinking? Okay, I'm not seeing anything more in the chat. All right, then we will move on to an actual example within the bins themselves. So the first question we have for you tonight is in mathematics, what does division do for us? And I am, this is going to be something really strange for you probably as a math teacher, because this is not typically a question you would see written on a chalkboard or a whiteboard. This is, this is different. We're asking for meaning. So actually, this is going to be the open mic part of our presentation today. And we're going to ask you, what was your immediate thought when you, when you saw that? Did you feel uncomfortable? Did you feel like, where's the math? Share what you thought in your head when you saw that question. Just pop right off mute and jump right in. I see Tracy is sharing in the chat. Equal groups. Thanks, Tracy. I see it requires some deep thinking, probably deep thinking versus calculation. Um, Ratio. Okay, great. What else do we have out there? I guess it got me to think about why we might do it in real life you know, like what's the purpose of division is kind of what first popped into my head. And then how to say that, how to, and then what does that actually mean? So how would it, you know, to think through that takes more than a second to, okay, you know, why would we need to break this number down and for what? It's kind of what I started thinking initially, but you know, good question. Thanks, Brian. That's probably where most people's heads go. What am I supposed to do with this? I'm seeing quotient and remainder again in the chat, and I'm seeing same number, how many groups containing the same number of items? So grouping, some grouping theory. Excellent, thank you very much for sharing. I know that was a little bit awkward because it's not, as math teachers, it's not quite what we're used to. All right, let's look at our next question then. It will pop up in red. So without computing, just stop yourself right there, put that pencil right down, do not compute. What is one meaning of division you can use to make sense of 10 divided by two tenths or 10 divided by one fifth? Think about that for a second. Not interested in the solution here. How would you make sense of that using division? This is a tough one because I'm really asking you to stretch your Stretch your mind. What's your your immediate reaction is to go to calculations, right? Okay, I'm seeing in the chat, how many two tenths are there? Sorry, that moved quickly. Are there in 10 items? How many groups of size one fifth go into 10? How do we, how is this different? Oh, I see one more. Let me get the last one I'm seeing. How would I explain it by cutting each pizza into five pieces? How many pieces would you have? That's an interesting one. That's something that came up in with our students when we did this with kids. Pizza was the favorite fractional item of choice. Everyone used pizza. So I can tell we have some teachers in the house. How many groups of 20 cents? fit into $10. Good, I haven't, I hadn't had that one before. Excellent. That's a different way of thinking about this. 
So in the past, how is this different than you might have seen this in the past? What, the, what would, might the question have looked like in the past? And how do we create space to do this in our classrooms? How do we give us license to ask questions like this in our classrooms? Just food for thought. I'm gonna move us along to our next question tonight. I'm gonna to add on to that. Okay, now I'm, I've changed the game a little bit. So looking at this one without computing again, what is the one meaning of division you could use to make sense of negative 10 divided by two tenths or negative 10 divided by one fifth? So I've changed my question a bit. How are these questions requesting something really different from students than we typically do? How is this different than what we're asking kids to do? Can someone name for me that difference? Just call it out, or if you're a good typer, type that right in the chat. It makes me think, Tammy, of um, one of the effective teaching practices that Ted um, talked about and that Peter put into the chat that we don't often talk about the verbal part of mathematics or the contextual part of mathematics. Like kids don't actually create those. We spend more time in the symbolic world. And this is forcing us to think visual and contextual and, and verbal. Thanks, Mary. It feels like it's starting to, it's it's a pathway down to, like you said, the the, the mathematical practices. It's actually making them perhaps come alive in a different way than we had thought in the past. Anyone else? Thoughts on that? I can, I can really see the sense making here. And I'm thinking back to what Katrina had said earlier, that when students have meaning, when, when they're thinking about the mathematics grounded in meaning, they don't have to memorize procedures. So that idea of just using reasoning or valuing reasoning more than valuing computing and answers. It's, I think that's a big shift for instruction. I, oh my, I would agree. And it really causes us to think about our practice differently, our teaching practices. Um, it pushes on our how we, how we teach and what we value. Okay, let's go to our last piece of this. And for this one, Without computing again, of course, describe how you can estimate the value of negative 10 divided by negative 3 tenths using division as comparison, copies of, or times as large. How would you do that? Because now we're, we're talking about the negative, a double negative in, in our expression. Thoughts on how we might think of that? What did you have to work through? with regard to your understanding of fractions here. And if you'll notice, my questions are getting a little bit tougher. I'm really starting to push on our, all of our thinking. I'm, I have thought about this and each time I see these questions, I rethink my own thinking. I continue to evolve here. Okay, let's, let's move on um, this evening to the fractions bin and take a little look at the fractions bin and see what we're extracting there if we can get if we can get uh, some thinking around this. So what important aspects of fractions did you draw upon? We weren't in the fractions bin necessarily, we were in the operations bin, but now you get a feel for how they overlap and how one question can easily become part of several bins. I see these are good thinker questions, yes that they are. So most of you, as I saw in the chat, you, you were basically A copies of one over B. That's really what you are saying to me. That was, that was definitely surfacing for you there um, with the fractions. You, you had many ways to say that to me, but that was in essence what, what you were doing, as well as the grouping. I heard in the chat, I read a lot about um, grouping, which is also another aspect of, of the fractions. So thank you. Okay, now let's look at what these actually look like. 
and my colleague Chet is going to drag that onto the screen for us and you are going he's going to scroll through that and we are just going to I'm going to walk you through what those um, the conversation starters look like. <clears throat> so right here you see the purpose, the audience and the application, just a general overview of all of the form formative conversation starters. They're at the front of each one of them. They're identical as they are describing its purpose and how you might think about them. And next, what you'll come across is the bins that we referenced. And these are all of the bins with their descriptions. Tonight, you got to see the operations in the fraction bin, but when you open your documents, you will get to see the remainder of the bins um, as they currently sit. The next thing you will come across is how to conduct a formative conversation starter. Now, this is just a beginning starting point. You can certainly um, add a few steps or draw out on a few steps as you see fit, but this gives you a nice guide as to how to begin with the formative conversation starters initially. Then we finally move into the first com formative conversation starter. And what you'll see is at the top, you'll see this is fourth grade. It is the first one and we are looking at comparisons here. The comparison bin is highlighted for you as well as the alignment to the common core standards. And it also indicates what the item focuses on. Then you'll see the conversation starter begin itself. This is the actual task or question is, that's being asked initially of students. Um, that is the full task and that is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, based upon the grade level. Here you will see the questions only. These are all of the questions, some of which I've asked you tonight. These are divided into uh, sections, if you will, to make it easier and allow you to expand and explore as you go. These can be put in front of students. Um, they do include the questions, but we have another section for you for specifically for students. Here we have the annotated section that you're seeing on your screen now. It comes with the questions and then some possible solutions that you might expect to receive from students. And it also helps you as a teacher to really think through um, some of the concepts yourself. So I love this section, I, I spend a great amount of my time in the annotated section with the questions. And finally, you'll see the shareables. This is the part that's simply the, the questions, the question itself, as long as well as the different sections where we're asking students to explore something beyond the initial question. And then as he Ted scrolls, you'll see that it continues. So this would be fourth grade, second question, place value. And they continue. Each one is between 20, I believe, at 20 and 30, 39 pages um, in total. And they're, as we said, uh, by grade level. And you will, these will be shared with you and we will be putting some links in the, in the chat soon so that you can um, have, the, have the links themselves and view them yourself. Any questions before we continue? Okay. All right. So next we have um, actually a formative conversation starter in front of you, which is something that you have, we have just gone through the documents. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so there's going to be three parts to this, and I'll try to go slowly here. So the first part of this is what I would like you to do is I'm going to give you a minute of think time. And then I'd like you to type in the chat what you were thinking. Don't hit enter just yet. Just type it in there. Just hold on. We're going to do a little bit of a waterfall. And this will allow everyone to read the chat and see what each of you are thinking. And th here's, the, here's the focus for us tonight. This item focuses on ordering fractions. However, it also provides opportunities to talk about. What else do you think we could talk about given this particular formative conversation starter? And you'll notice on the screen that it's blurred out. We want to get some of your thinking first. So take, take a moment and get it typed in there. Just don't hit enter quite yet. And I'll tell you when to hit enter. Tammy, will you read us the question just in case um, people are having trouble seeing it on the screen? I will absolutely do so. The question reads, move the fractions so that they are in order from least to greatest. 
and the fractions on the screen are 3 eighths, 5 6 11 twelfths, and 1 half. I'm going to give you about 15 more seconds to type in the chat, and then I'll hit, we'll hit enter in just a moment. Okay, hit enter. What are you thinking? Oh, this is excellent. I see someone put them in order for us. Mary thought about, I thought about how close one half to one half or one each fraction was. That helped her in ordering. Ah, what the denominator means. Someone else thought about comparing to one half. Why one half? That's interesting. One half and one, another one, yes. Those are like our benchmarks, right? There's something we can compare to. Here I have the numerator and the denominator related to one another. Okay. Moving towards a whole number, Brian, thank you. Excellent. Great. So now let's see what that might look like. So part two. All right. I am going to pass this back to my colleague, Ted, and he is going to... Oh, I'm sorry, Ted. I'm a little bit ahead of myself, aren't I? I'm just getting so excited for the videos. My goodness. Excuse me. Okay. So part two. We are gonna open the, the grade four formative conversation starters. My colleague, Ted, is going to place that in the chat for us um, so that you can actually see the, the grade four formative conversation starters. Shortly, I'm gonna ask that you're sent to breakout rooms with you know, three to five colleagues. We'll see how many we get there. And then I'm gonna ask you to click on the link to the formative conversation paper that's now in the chat. You're gonna open the link to a Jamboard which is now also being placed in the chat. So you should have links in the chat. You're going to select the board with the same number as your breakout room. So if you're going to breakout room number two, then you're gonna select board number two on the Jamboard when you arrive. This will be approximately a 10 minute activity. And what we're asking you to do is to read the questions and then type your answers to the questions right in your Jamboard. So I'm gonna to pause to make sure everyone gets their links open. They can see everything and they have access and the directions are clear. Any questions from our audience? I'm watching the chat and I'm seeing none. Okay, so I think we are ready to go then to our breakout rooms. All right, I am going to come off mute here for just a second and share some of uh, with Tammy and Ted because they didn't hop in because as many as you know of you know now that you've taught virtually. When you hop into a virtual room, everybody stops talking. Um, <laughs> so some of what um, we saw as I was looking, of course, um, folks really saw that, yes, okay, this is the bin in fractions, but um, definitely comparisons clearly was living there as well. And really had a great conversation in our group about additive versus multiplicative, because you kind of have to live in both spaces when you compare fractions. Um, but then there's also ideas around measurement and proportional relationships. And then there's a lot of really great conversations that were going on um, in some of the groups that I can see across the jam boards around um, how, what additional questions we might ask, um, but also how this might be a great thing to do, not just with an individual student, but also some classroom conversations, like what about doing a human number line? So a lot of, a lot of great conversations going on. Thank you for getting us, getting our brains moving. Awesome. Thanks, Mary, for, for summarizing. And um, now we're going to move on to the, the second part of the presentation. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll unblur this one. So we, we also said, look, in the, in the clusters of questions that you're going to see, you, you will also hit on whole numbers, of the importance of the, having the same whole comparisons and flexibility with fraction understandings. 
Uh, so, so all kinds of possibilities that you noticed. Here, I want to I want to give you some clusters because we're going to show you some video clips. And so I'm, I'm going to go through these kind of quickly, but I want you to I want you to think about how you might answer them, or even how you think these students are going to answer them. So the first question is, what is a fraction? And we're going to show you some of them, not all of them. Uh, is a fraction two numbers or one number? What other words are used when you talk about fractions, and what do they mean? And what do you think of when you see the fraction three eighths? And if it means three out of eight, then what might eight thirds mean? So that's that's one cluster of questions. Here's another one. Five circles, two of them are shaded in. One question, how could you use this diagram to show that two fifths is two times as large as one fifth? Now that you've read the bins, you know why that question exists. That's, a, uh, that's in there with the uh, multiplicative comparison. How could you use this diagram to show that two fifths is two times as large as two tenths? How could the diagram represent two fifths? There are five circles in the diagram, but is there a way you could use the five circles to show two thirds? All right, so we, pull, we pulled some highlights of students working on these, and we're going, we're going to share them with you now. We want you to see the power of asking these kinds of questions and, and not jumping in and teaching, but listening, continuing to ask. It's really hard as teachers. We want to start scaffolding. We want to start building on top of what they're saying and teach them. But the longer you listen, the more questions you ask, the more you'll understand what they're thinking. You'll be able to put that together. So listen. You'll hear the, you'll, you'll hear the, uh, the interviewer listening, not teaching. It's not about right or wrong right now. It's about student thinking. So you'll hear things like, can you tell me more? You look like you're really thinking. What are you thinking? Could you draw me a picture? How'd you get that answer? Is there another way you could find that answer? Those are the kinds of things that, that happen here. So it's not a teaching exercise. It's a listening exercise on the, part of the, on the part of the instructor. So here we go with video clip number one. Is a fraction just one number or is it two numbers? It is actually, well, it depends on what you mean by that. So if you mean like, how how many parts are there in a fraction? Well, it depends on what your denominator is. But there are two main numbers in a fraction, the numerator and the denominator. Like three eighths. I'm looking at the problem three eighths. Is that one number or is three eighths two different numbers? Three eighths is two different numbers, but it would all lead to one number. Okay, what what is the so let's stick with three eighths, Trenton. What is the one number that it leads to? The the one number, no, no, I think it, that's incorrect. It doesn't lead to anything. It is two numbers, but it does not lead to anything. Three eighths is three eighths. Three over eight is usually just the three is your numerator. Eighth is the denominator. The denominator, and that's like your whole number. That's how no, it's not whole. Number. That's how many. Let's say, let's say that's that's your goal, correct? You have three out of your eight. You don't have so it's two numbers. Mm, thank you, Trenton. Myla, any thoughts? One number or two numbers for a fraction? Um, well, I think it might be one or two because a fraction can make one whole. Let's say, um, I had a pizza that was cut into eight pieces and, uh, everyone took the whole entire pizza. That'd be one whole. And so it kind of basically depends where this fraction ends up no matter what problem it goes to, it's gonna be one or two. Is a fraction. All right, now let me show you the, the next video clip. Now in this diagram, how can you show, how can you use this diagram to show that two fifths is two times as big as one fifth? I'm going to repeat that question one more time. How can you use this diagram to show that two fifths is two times as big as one fifth? I found out the denominator is five because there's five dots in all. 
and my numerator is two because the two dots that are colored in. So I'm guessing that two fifths is just something that we could keep in the area to try to find our question. Thanks, Trenton. One fifth is um less or fewer than um two fifths because first of all um what's the common denominator what's the common denominator i could use 10. so if i were to take um two tenths and simplify it that would be one fifth if i were to take two wait did i say one fifth already or did i say two fifths i heard you say one fifth right now yeah one fifth unsimplified would be um I mean, two two tenths unsimplified would stay as two tenths, and um, simplified it would be one fifth. Two fifths simplified. I mean, un, I mean, um, four tenths unsimplified would stay as four tenths, but um, four tenths simplified would become um, two and five, two out of five. And with those five circles, is it possible to show me two thirds? Can you show me using those five circles, two thirds? No, I don't believe you can, but in a way, if you like split it in the middle or somewhat close to the middle, it'd be two and then three. Okay. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I'm just um, guessing for right now. I feel like something in five that's a fraction could be equal to, did you say two thirds? I did say two thirds. Um, so there might be a fraction that has a denominator of five that equals to two thirds maybe. So that's just what I think. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Anita, who's going to walk us through some of this. Thanks, Ted. So I just would really love to hear from you all. Um, what kind of thinking did you hear and see from the students? Please come off mute and share um, your reactions. What did you hear? So my light in particular with the, I think the first question, she was really trying to relate it to a real life scenario with the, um, the pizza slices. And so she was, she was unsure if it was like one or two numbers, but she realized that if somebody took a whole pizza, that's just like one thing. So she was trying to relate it to something um, more meaningful, what she can connect to. Thank you. So were they thinking of the fractions as one number or were they thinking of them as two numbers? What did you hear to kind of help you figure that out? Did you hear any examples of the copies of type thinking that we were talking about before with the bins? Definitely, Tracy. They were definitely arguing with themselves or like going through their metacognitive strategies, trying to figure out, um, is it one number? Is it two numbers? Um, wh what really is the fraction that I'm trying to consider here? What is the fraction? Because they're learning from each other's conversations, right? So how are we supporting them in developing that copies of thinking that we talked about when we first looked at it, right? So how are we beginning to build their thinking and being flexible about those whole numbers? Did they notice a whole number? When did they start thinking about one and two? Who introduced that concept first? What, what, I would, what I would love to do is talk about what did you see the facilitator doing, right? How did you hear the teacher um, give them space and time just to ruminate, to opine, to think? Talk about that a little bit. We have a little bit of a shy audience, Anita, so I'm going to chime in. That's all I, right. I appreciate it. 
I, I could recognize, like I appreciated Ted's cue at the beginning of like, this is just about listening. This isn't about teaching. And it's as a, as an educator, it's so hard to like shut down your teacher voice and just listen. Um, and the facilitator did such a great job of just letting the students talk, whatever they said, even if what they said wasn't necessarily making sense, or if, or like somebody else said, they're contradicting with themselves. Like it didn't matter. It, he just left the space. And one of the things that um, I was reflecting on as we were watching the video is how different it feels than in a classroom setting, where even if you said the same things as a teacher, there's a different sense of urgency in a classroom setting with all of the kids where I don't know if it's like people don't like the uncomfortable silence or kids expect that like we're supposed to give answers now or the teacher's not going to talk again until somebody says the right answer. Mm -hmm. So just the way that um, the, the question prompts and the way that the facilitator managed the students created mm -hmm. that space for thinking that I think it's lost in instruction sometimes. Thank you, Joni. So I have a question. So I'm the I'm not the math person here. Um, when I taught, I was a science department chair. And my sister Mary was the math department chair. So it runs in our family. But my question is, would you ever have the opportunity? I would think this would happen in a face-to-face -face classroom more easily Zoom. But instead of the the teacher going to one person and then coming back, back and forth with one student, I would think there'd be a great opportunity for someone to say, so what do you think about that? How can you, do you agree with that logic? And using talk moves, in other words, to be able to really generate that discourse, it's so rich for that. Uh, it would be a great opportunity to be able to help other students come into play. And I really like the fact that the, the lead teacher was not trying to give away the answer, but as Joni was saying, really a good listener. But I, I just really, I really would love to see more of interactions between the students rather than a one-to-one -one type of thing. We'll open that up for anybody to respond. I, of course, already have a response. Have any of you led math talks before with your students? So I think um, one of the things when you're trying to get students to respond to each other, sometimes you may have to ask a student to repeat what the other students said, because if, you know, if they're there in a classroom quietly and one person is speaking, sometimes the other students kind of zone out. Mm -hmm. So you have to check in with the, the listeners to see if they actually listen to what that first student stated in mm -hmm. order to give a rebuttal of, of some sort. And there was one part in the video where I think the student was explaining himself and he forgot where he was in his explanation. He's like, mm -hmm. did, did I say two tenths or four tenths? Like he just forgot. Mm -hmm. And the teacher said it was this particular fraction that you, that you stated. And um, in addition to that, sometimes you may have to call on another student to respond to the first student because not all students are going to say, well, based on what Susie stated, this is my opinion. You're gonna have to open that up. Thank and, you. And it, go ahead. I was gonna say, and also, you know, these videos that you're watching, they're, they're clips, they're snippets, but really they were, they were whole groups of people, of kids that were involved in these things. So there was the back and forth. There is the, and there was what was very cool because we were doing this during COVID is the chat. And, the, and what you don't see in this video is what was going on in the chat between the students as well, so. And, and also the, teach, the facilitator, um, I think was really skillful at focusing the students' answers, but not funneling, right? So he identified some mathematical underpinnings in somebody's response without saying, I'm zooming in on you have the right answer. He allowed space for the students to just explain their thinking, right? And to come to their own conclusion and never validated whether it was the answer he was looking for, right? Because now that information that he's elicited from the student, he can use that for scaffolding. 
grouping in any different way. I mean, you can group students according to how they like to share their responses. Um, if they like to draw, if they like to speak, if they like to um, act out, right? But the only way for us to get these um, conversations going is by understanding that we do the work first of figuring out where we want the math to go, but allowing our questions, right, and our techniques, and for us to be vulnerable enough to know that it can go all kinds of ways, right? But we, we have to create that space, create that classroom culture so that students know that you're going to make mistakes and we're going to investigate those mistakes and we're all going to together come to some sort of um, symbiosis. Anita, you were one of the very first teachers to try these. What, uh, what sort of things went through your mind? What did you have to keep reminding yourself of when you, when you were doing this? Um, I am not waiting for them to say the answer. I am not waiting for them to read my mind. Um, I was thinking about where is some math terminology, any sort of, even if it wasn't the right word, but any sort of understanding that, oh, there's an idea, let me dig deeper into that. And I had to stop myself from using my facial cues and say, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, tell me more about that because I, I'm very emotive as you can see. So I had to really try hard to hold myself back and to leave quiet time, think time, processing time, um, and not feel like it was um, a, a rush or an urgency for them to answer, so. Anita, what was the most fun part of this for you? Like what really just made you really smile when you, when you did this? When first, am I telling everybody what I know? When, um, <laughs> okay, he's my son. So when my son was doing the video with me, he used real life examples that I knew exactly what he was talking about, but I knew the people, other folks wouldn't know. And so it was so fun for me to try to get it out of him without giving away any answers, right? And for him to like have that aha moment to say, oh, let me explain it to you so that you can understand because you don't live with me. And so when he felt confident enough to explain using Wheel of Fortune um, and, and using, um, just, you know, everyday terminology and saying that that's accepted in math class, that was what was most fun for me. So Anita, Ted started off by talking about the fact that in the midst of the last few years, we have had very challenging times of kids having interrupted moments of learning and learning in different ways, for instance, maybe from Wheel of Fortune, but like just very different ways of learning mathematics. And so I really would love um, if you could sort of speak to how you see these as being a valuable, like the formative conversation starters, like where do you see those as being part of your work with students and how that might play a role in, in, in some of that? I don't know if I'm going to go where you expected me to, but let's do it. So because we went online, um, lots of students who aren't typically comfortable with talking and being in the spotlight were now required to talk, right? And, and show more of themselves than maybe they would have in, in a normal classroom setting. So they had to build a different muscle, right? They had to practice something that they weren't used to. And once they realized that they weren't gonna you know, burn up and that it was okay and that the teacher wanted to hear from them, um, you kind of build their, their uh, positive, not just math identity, but their positive identity as a student. And you help them understand that um, mathematics is for everybody and that we're all doers of math. And they can now identify with things that happen in their homes that we, because we were trying to be uh, relevant and responsive to everything going on, we as teachers started to find ways to bring their homes into the school, right? And once they felt like they could bring their whole selves into the situation, students become more comfortable with the mathematics. And obviously, you know, you understand that there's other um, issues, you know, SEL issues that are going on that um, it may take some students a little bit longer than others, but just understanding as the teacher that if you make the space for them, to kind of be themselves and, and, and make those mistakes. And um, we inspect those mistakes and respect their um, responses. Some students um, who thrive better in a, in a virtual environment, right? 
can bring those those skills back to the classroom and now all of a sudden you have a, a different group of kids than you had before this um, unfortunate uh, event yeah. happened. I love you. Every time I talk to you, I hear the, the asset based thinking and the brilliance of it. I'm going to push you because I want to know, okay, so what's the role of the conversation starters? Like in all of that, what's your, how does, how do the conversation starters play into all you, of that? It, it's rooted in understanding that there's the bids, right? There's the big ideas that are not specific to any grade level, that students have these ideas that travel with them from pre-K to beyond, and understanding that we have to hone our own skills as facilitators to bring out the conversation, right? To help students figure out what their mathematical voice is, right? So we have to practice that. And, and it's, it's different for folks, you know, and we have to have those opportunities ourselves to think differently, right? To rethink, how am I going to not put the math in them, but help them find vocabulary and understanding um, to, to share the math that's already there. I'm going to pause here, and I know we've, uh, Journey has said the group is quiet, although actually I think um, all of you have been quite, gotten quite active in the, the chat. Is there anything that any of you want to come off of mute um, as, we're, as we're wrapping up and ask any of our presenters? So welcome to type it in the chat. <laughs> well, so I'm going to give you a little bit of time to think, and I'm going to give some concluding thoughts before I uh, hand it back. Um, so Ted started this conversation really with thinking about so much around um, ways of thinking, ways of doing, habits of, of thinking, and, and really this idea of decluttering the learning. And I just want to hold on to that idea because as I've looked at these formative uh, conversation starters and the way Anita talked about them has just been such a powerful um, idea for me around starting to think about how do I use these as separate but informing of my curriculum like maybe they're not they're not exactly what's in the curriculum although some of them probably have those feel to it they may look like a curricular task but the follow-up questions and the ways that I even I think Peter was talking about using our um, our ways of encouraging like add on and revoice and you know really getting kids to, to build off of each other's ideas there is so much we can learn and as I said I thought my goal is to sort of say like, I think this is pushing us in the assessment frame that is very different than the way that we talk about assessment. It, too often we, we spend our time thinking about, you know, did they get this question right or wrong? But these are so much more rich and they're not about the, did they get that right or wrong, but what do we learn? And, and I really just love Anita, even just the way that you talked about, um, you know, Sometimes we group kids based on how they answered a question that's about right or wrong, but you were talking about, did they draw pictures or did they conceive of the fraction this way or that way? And, and just such a powerful, much more rich way of digging in with kids and providing them a different way of really being in mathematics. Um, in my midst of talking, there's been a couple questions. So uh, I'll, I'll open it up to either Ted or Nita to Tammy. Um, let's start with Tracy's. What grade levels, so this is definitely the Nita question. What grade levels did you talk? Which grade levels seemed the most receptive and excited about the conversations? Okay, so I have taught high school math. I've um, co-taught uh, middle school math and I've supported K to 12 math. Um, it really depends on the teacher, um, which ones go better. And I, I say this because it's about equity. If you um, come to the conversation understanding that students will respond however you present it to them, the, the teachers that I've been most successful with are those who get the kids at the rug and, and have those conversations, um, what do you call those things? Um, talking points, rules for discussion. If you have the students come together and have establish those rules for discussion, um, you can do it starting with kindergarten. Um, I've had um, 
any kind of curriculum, I've actually supported four or five different types of curriculum. And I've had folks who um, find at the very beginning of their class, they can insert them into their math talks or in place of their math talks. Um, I've, the highest grade I've worked with with this um, form of teaching is uh, 11th grade. I haven't worked with any 12th grade. Anita, you just muted yourself. <laughs> I think that was somebody meeting me. Oh. <laughs> I, I do this. <laughs> All righty. Um, and then I think this last question, it looks like most of the rest of the questions got answered in the chat, but this one from, from PS, um, what, at what point would you correct a student's misunderstanding of a question? I think that's a, an interesting uh, question to answer. Should I volley? Yeah. Is, is it the is it the misunderstanding of the question or is it a mathematical misunderstanding that the, that question is about? I would say a mathematical misunderstanding. So you're giving them the space to explain something. And let's say in the back of your mind, you know that their explanation is is clearly wrong. Right. So at what point do you step in and try to guide them to the right thinking or or tell them, okay, that's that's a misunderstanding that you have. Let's let's try to think in, in terms of this way because they may not be able to develop the right thing on their own. So at what point does that happen? I, I think I would say something like, look, we're, we're, you, you wanna set up a, a space that's safe, right? And so this is about, you're sharing ideas. Look, we'll, we'll talk about fixing things or however you wanna phrase it later on. Right, but right now, right, during this during this type of routine, during this thing, it's it's the chance for them to listen, and or to 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 speak, and for the and for the teacher to listen. Sometimes what happens is you keep you can keep asking these probing questions, and then the aha will come up, <laughs> and then they'll be like, oh wait a second, I just contradicted myself, and they'll start to put the ideas together. So sometimes it's worth getting through this whole thing, and then you and then you know then you've got the stuff up you know that you're thinking about going. I really do want to work with these students on these things. And I would add, if you get them to the aha place where you see that they, they're, they're thinking in a way that is correct, you can ask, re-ask the question, um, go back to the space in which the error was made and re-ask the question, ask them, would you like to think about that again, based upon your new uncovered um, information or whatever it may be. And I've seen that work very effectively as well. All right. Well, I really just want to thank our three presenters. Um, just such a engaging conversation. And um, so now I'd like to take uh, just a moment to introduce uh, Joni Funderburg, who's going to share a few words um, about Texas Instruments. Thanks, Mary. And thank you to, to Ted, to Tammy, to Anita, and to all of you for engaging with us tonight. This is a really interesting conversation. And um, like Mary, I got a little sneak peek at these ideas from the time they were just a kernel of an idea and to see how they've all come together and to see the interesting conversation that they've generated tonight. And hopefully the way that we've cha they've challenged, you know, the way that we've always thought about things. I so appreciated Peter's comment in the chat that yeah, this is making me think about math a little bit differently um, and certainly thinking about how we engage in conversation with students about math. So um, TI is just grateful that we have the opportunity to support great work like this is, that's happening. And we're grateful for all of you for taking some time out of what we know is a really busy day at a really busy time of the year uh, to enjoy to join us, to engage in the conversation, whether you uh, unmuted and shared your thinking or shared in the chat or participated in the Jamboard. Uh, we're just grateful for all of you. So thanks so much to everyone who made tonight happen. And I'm going to turn it back over to Peter to wrap us up. Yeah, thank you very much, Shoni. Well said. Um, you know, in reflecting on this, this, this session, <clears throat> it just comes back to me that what you're really trying to do is making the students thinking visible. It's a great opportunity to see what's in their heads and how they are processing. Fantastic opportunities to be able to formatively assess where students are so that you as teachers can really guide your instruction more appropriately to make sure these concepts come across. Fantastic. And 
to help that along, we had this great host of participants as well as presenters. And I want to thank Mary Pittman for as being the moderator. And of course, our presenters, Ted Coe, Tammy Bauman, and Anita Brown, who all shared their expertise so well in helping to be able to show this, this new and exciting tool that I'm sure educators would really be valuable for. Hey, you know, if you really thought this was a good session, May 4th, we have another event coming up. And this time, you may want to talk about inviting your science colleagues with this, because what we're going to do on that May event is focus on something called engaging students in science using cross-cutting concepts to prompt students' sense-making of phenomena. It's another form of assessment technique, and it's something that I think would really be um, valuable. And I know the presenters that are coming in, believe me, it's going to be an exciting thing. So here's the other thing. Keep an eye out on your email because it's there's no such thing as a free lunch. You know, you're going to get the link for the recording session, the recording of this particular session, but there's also going to be a link for a feedback survey. We really need to hear from you in terms of how did we do? What could we do better? And uh, we would appreciate you giving those thoughts and feedback for tonight's session, as well as any ideas for future sessions that you might think would happen. So you'll find a link to the survey in the chat box now. Joni just plugged it in there. So please take a time to, um, to complete it. The sooner the better so you have these thoughts right in your mind. So with that, what I want to be able to say to you all is thank you so much for your participation. Thank you to our presenters, our moderators, and most importantly, thank you to all of you, the educators that are making a difference every single day. Have a great night.